Our second reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verses 13 to 25. We join Paul as he is here talking about sin and grace, about death and the law. It can get a bit confusing in this section of Romans, so one helpful way to follow Paul's argument is to look for the questions that he asks and then try to find the answers. For example, in chapter 7, earlier in verse 7, Paul asks, What then should we say that the law is sin? And the answer to this question comes five verses later when Paul says, So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Paul continues trying to work out this question of law and grace with a question that gives direction for our verses today. It's the first verse we read, verse 13. He says, Did what is good, i.e. the law, then bring death to me? Sometimes speaking for himself, sometimes speaking as a representative of all humanity, Paul seeks to answer that question in our verses for today. So let us hear this word of God. Did what is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin working death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning, I'd like to begin by sharing with you a true story. In 1962, 55 years ago, there was a fire in the city landfill in Centralia, Pennsylvania. It may have been local firefighters who started the blaze as they were cleaning the landfill and didn't properly extinguish it. It may have been hot coals and ash dumped into the landfill without a proper clay barrier. But the fire started and through bad luck it spread underground where it was even harder to extinguish, and eventually it reached the veins of coal. Throughout the 1960s and the 1970s, the fire raged mostly out of sight underground, and the town figured that it would eventually burn itself out. But even after the fire forced the coal mines to close, they pretended not to worry about it. But by the late 1970s, the air was filled with sulfur and smoke. Roads were hot and buckled. Trees and grass had been baked white. And volunteers put out flames that erupted on the surface from time to time. 
The rest of Pennsylvania began paying attention to the fire in, under Centralia in 1981 when 12-year-old Todd Dombrowski noticed smoke coming from his grandmother's yard. And he went to see if someone had thrown a cigarette into the leaves. But all of a sudden, the ground gave way, opening a sinkhole four feet wide and 150 feet deep. If not for the quick assistance of Todd's cousin, Eric, Todd would certainly have lost his life. The temperatures in the hole were nearly 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The hot, billowing steam brought a lethal level of carbon monoxide to the surface. It was two years later when large sections of Centralia's main highway, Route 61, caved in. Pennsylvania's Office of Surface Mining, which had been monitoring the fire for years, estimated that the only way to stop it would be to dig a 500-foot deep trench around the entire town. The estimated price tag was uh, $663 million, be roughly $1.6 billion today. And there was no guarantee that it would actually work. So instead, in 1984, more than 20 years after the fire began, the United States Congress offered $42 million to buy out all the homes and businesses and relocate the town's residents. At the time, the population in town was roughly 1,100 people. By 1991, most folks had chosen to go, but not everyone. There were a few holdouts, and they suspected that all of this, especially that plan about the trench, was really a government plot designed to get their coal and mineral rights. So they fought with every available court to them. And despite losing every time, despite the fact that their homes have been condemned by the state, and even the United States Postal Service has revoked their zip code, they continue to live today in Centralia. By last count in 2013, the community still had seven residents. State and local officials in 2013 have reached an agreement with these remaining residents to allow them to live out their lives in Centralia, after which their property will be taken through eminent domain. The fire's still burning. And some estimates say that it will for another 250 years. In the hottest part of town, where the fire is closest to the surface, there are pipes which vent the noxious gases. So every street smells and tastes of sulfur. The town is literally a smoking hell. The story of Centralia, Pennsylvania is almost unbelievable. And yet it's also a story I think that we recognize. It's the story of half measures and complacency and conspiracy theories and denial. And little by little, the ground is literally collapsing under their feet. I think the Apostle Paul would have understood the story of Centralia, especially as we think about his words we just read in this seventh chapter of Romans. Beginning with the theologian Augustine in the fourth century throughout the Middle Ages and the Reformation, and even in many interpreters today, these words are thought to be Paul's anguished internal wrestling with his inability to keep God's law a law that imposes impossible burdens, a law that incites sin by putting bad ideas into his head, a law that produces nothing but guilt due to inability to keep it. And that fits well with our own experience, right? We struggle to do what is right. We feel guilty when we don't. We've been taught that Judaism is a religion of law, Christianity a religion of grace, and the two do not meet. Hearing Paul's words, we even rejoice maybe a little that 
Paul's a lot like us, failed and flawed. I think if we take this chapter 7, we move it from its context, then there's no problem at all with an interpretation just like that. It becomes all introspective and individualistic and anguished and all about a failure to keep God's law. Yes, the problem is law, and the answer is grace. But remembering how I introduced our scripture reading this morning should give us at least a moment of pause. Remember, Paul writes, what then should we say, that the law is sin? And his answer was, by no means. He continues, did the law, which is good, then bring death to me? Same answer, by no means. Those are the questions and answers that drive Paul's argument here. So declaring that, Paul, that the point of this text is Paul's inability to follow the law is kind of like saying the real problem in Centralia, Pennsylvania, is that too many people are speeding on Route 61. It ignores the deeper problem which Paul calls sin and which Centralia knows is this underground fire which creates sinkholes in Route 61 which swallow cars whether they're speeding or not. Those of you who were with us last Sunday might remember that we talked about how in this section of Paul's letter, he's not primarily interested in sin as individual failings or trespasses. No, Paul is talking about sin as a power, an aggressive power that takes hold of God's good gifts and bends them toward death and destruction. Sin is the fire burning beneath the ground which taints everything, even our best attempts to do good with ash and the smell of sulfur. My friends, just like Paul, we know what is right. We know what is good. And we even want to do it. How many of us woke up this morning and said, I'm going to make as many bad decisions as possible today? No, we just don't do that. That's not how we go about life. No, we make decisions. We act with the very best of intentions. And yet somehow, everything continues to go wrong. This is the dilemma that Paul's talking about. And he knows it from personal experience. Remember, Paul persecuted Christians. Why? Not because he failed to keep the law. No, because he kept a law that sin had hijacked for its own purposes. Let's jump to our own context just for a minute. We know that there is a problem in this country ensuring that everyone has access to quality and affordable health care. And yet, no matter what solution is developed, what party is in power, the problem and our ability to agree upon it seems to keep getting worse. We know there are problems of economic inequality in this country and in the world, and no matter what solutions we develop to fix it, it keeps getting worse. We know there's a crisis of education in our nation's schools. We know there's a problem with violence in our homes, in our communities, in our nation, and between nations. We know there are deep divisions in this country over race and nationality and creed. And despite all our attempts at good and faithful correction, it seems to be getting worse. The fire still burns. What we find in Paul's argument then is the same thing we find with that fire in Centralia, Pennsylvania. It's the same thing we find in all those situations I just named. And it's tragedy. No matter what we do, despite our very attempts to do good, what is right, we cannot put out the fire. We cannot escape the power of sin. That's why Paul declares himself at the end of this text not to be guilty, but to be wretched or tragic. 
Professor Paul Lochtemeyer puts it this way. He says, what Paul describes in these verses is the dilemma of all human beings who seek to follow God's will apart from Christ. Knowing they ought to do good, human beings nevertheless stumble under the power of sin into the very evil they seek to avoid. Trying to do the good, they in fact oppose the good until that point at which they recognize the good is in Christ. That's what Paul's talking about in these verses. He continues, apart from Christ and his power to break the hold of sin on humanity, humanity will only continue to bring about evil precisely through its intention to do good. Let me read that last sentence again, because if you don't remember anything else this morning, please remember this. Apart from Christ and his power to break the hold of sin on humanity, humanity will only continue to bring about evil precisely through its intention to do good. That's Paul's answer to the question he asked back in, chapter, back in verse 13. Did what is good, i.e. the law, then bring death to me? No, but only Christ can rescue us from our own best intentions. So what then do we do? As the fire continues to burn beneath our feet, we might be tempted to throw up our hands and declare it's better to do nothing, to embrace the wretchedness of life with resignation, to just live out our days in the midst of the sulfur and the smoke with half measures and complacency and conspiracy theories and denials. Perhaps we might even come to worship every Sunday and hope to find a temporary balm for our sin-sick souls. Or, or both as individuals and the church, perhaps we might put our hope in Christ. For the cross is the only way to put the fire out. With his life, with his death and resurrection, Christ has broken the hold of sin. He's loosed the chains. Or to use another biblical metaphor, when we put on Christ, we put on a fire suit. Yet, yes, Christ is already at work in this world, putting out fires, transforming lives, empowering new life and hope. And instead of sitting around watching the fires burn, instead of seeking to save the world with our own best intentions, we can find the places where Christ is already at work. We can join our lives with his. We can work toward a new and better day, a new and better world, knowing that Christ is the one making all things new. And you and I can be a part of that. This church, we can be a part of that if we put our hope and our trust in him. And who knows? Who knows if we are open and willing, if we join our lives and our work with Christ, then even at the places where the fire burns deepest, we might find ourselves one day declaring with Paul, Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty and amazing God, the fires burn. They burn beneath our feet. They threaten to overwhelm us, to taint even our best attempts to do good. Only you can break the hold of sin, can put the fire out. And you've done so in the cross and continue that work in the world. Give us courage, give us faith to join our lives with yours. That we might participate in your redemption of the world. In the new life you intend for us to share. Give us a heart and give us lips that we might declare, thanks be to God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.